Okay. We are continuing from where we left yesterday. We were discussing about uh, uh, the renewal, track renewal machines. And one of the machines which we discussed was Gaza's quick relaying system. Or uh, it can be any other manufacturer also like Simplex is also making the Simplex quick relaying system. It is only for that the name is there, but the normal, uh, the uh, general name is track laying equipment. Others are PQRS or SQRS, they are only brand names. Okay, so we have discussed this. Uh, in this, uh, we are renewing the track panel by panel. So, of course, you have to cut the rail and then remove it. So, you are basically, uh, so suppose you don't want to change the rails, only you want to change the sleepers. Then, what you can do is, you bring uh, uh, rail, uh, single rail, uh, rails of 12.6 or 13 meter or so. You take out these rails outside. And that will be used for auxiliary track, and then you put uh, release rails on the track, and then you can remove the track. The sleepers along with the release rails will be uh, removed, and then you pu put back the new pa panels. But again, those panels will be with the release rails, so uh, the panel will be linked. Then after that, you change these rails with the rails which you have already initially removed. So those rails will be again used. Okay, so in this system only you are. Practically renewing sleeper only, isn't it? Rail renewal by the machines. Rail renewal is manual, isn't it? Sleeper renewal is by machines, and only rail and the rail renewal is manually. The advanced version of this is the track laying equipment, in which the renewal of the sleeper as well as the rail is explained by the machine. So we'll discuss that thing. That is track relaying train. So, uh, this, uh, it is also in the form of a train, like your PQRS system, but only depends in this that uh, you are not cutting the rails. You are only uh, putting out the rails, removing the sleepers, putting back the new sleeper, and again bringing those rails back. And those rails are held by the machine itself. When they are removed, they are being held by the machine itself, and then they are brought together. So, it is something like this. The machine is... Uh, when machine is working, suppose this is the track, so it will pull out this rail like this. In this portion, the rail has been removed, then the sleepers will be removed and new sleepers will be coming in its place. And again here, the rails are coming in. So, the renewal part of the sleeper renewal takes place here and the rail may be pulled back. Or you can have new rails, suppose you want to change the rails. What you do is, instead of this one, you keep on removing this one and keep on adding the, uh, linking the new rail. They have, they have to just staggered in the height. Removal of the old rail and linking of the new rail. Okay. Basically, the new rails which are kept outside, you are joining them here. And these rails are, uh, the old rails are being removed. They are both at different levels. Okay, and the rail, these rails are, will be held by the machine. Something will be clear in this, not mm. much, but uh, we will try to see. Mm. This is the overhead gantry, uh, this overhead uh, portal crane, uh, which is moving on the BFR. Special arrangement is there for the moving on the BFR. What it is doing, it has brought the new sweepers. And it is going. And it, now it will pick up the release the old sleepers here at the bottom there. Now it is removing, which has been removed by the machine. The old sleepers which have been removed by the machine, it is picking up now. And it will take it and put in some empty uh, BFR. Yeah. Now the sleeper is placed on the second place. You can see these rails are being held by the machine, lifted up and held by the machine. And the new sleepers are coming from the top, and the old sleepers which are being removed, these are the old sleepers here in the bottom layer. Picked up by the machine. Machine is picking up here. 
can see this small sleepers are coming, taking a filter by the machine and putting the conveyor belt. And the new sleepers are coming here. The real thing you can see they are hanging in hanging position. And the sleeper spacer is there, which is maintaining the sleeper space. You can see the rail being hung outside this part. Now here the rail is coming in here, this, this part. So uh, uh, complete process is mechanized. No manual intervention except the fittings have to be removed manually and fitted manually. But there are machines for removing and uh, fixing of the fittings as well. This person is fitting, uh, keeping the fittings. Mm -hmm. You can see the liner which is keeping. Rubber pads are initially put, then the sleepers are coming down. Mm -hmm. And if this person is putting the pendulum clips, ERC. And the person here he is fixing it with the machine. Let's see. So, everything is mechanized. It is. These are the other attachments we are not discussing. This part. This is the BCM machine. So, you can see that the process is mechanized. Okay. So, in this, what happens is sleeper renewal is also taking place. Real renewal, if required, you do it. Otherwise, don't do it. You can link. Uh, you can keep this rail fluid outside and then same is coming inside. So same rail you can use. Or if you want new rail, you can connect it here, make a cut, uh, connect it here, remove this one outside. So this will be removed at the lower layer level and this will be connected at a higher level. So level difference will be there. This will be coming out, this will be going in. Okay. So rail renewal as well as sleeper renewal is taking place simultaneously. And the progress of this machine is around 400 track, uh, 400 Track meters per hour. Per effective hour. Of course, ineffective time is also there, uh, uh, which is around 40 to 45 minutes. Okay. Uh, so, 40 to 45 minutes initially and 40 to 45 minutes afterwards. So, one and a half hour is lost in this. That is the only disadvantage. As one and a half hour, there will be no work. Initially, 40 to 45 minutes, it will take. That this whole ring will come from the uh, station, then it will set up. So, all this setting up takes a lot of time. 40 45 minutes will be lost. Then, at the end, winding up also 40 45 minutes, one and a half hours is gone. So, if you uh, take block of two hours, you can open work only for half an hour. Progress will be 200 meters. But if you take four hour block, you remove one and a half hours, still you will have two and a half hours for working. So, two and a half to four hundred meters, one kilometer, one kilometer track you can change in four hours. That's too much, isn't it? Manually it is not possible. And you can see that handling it by machine, so uh, no damage to sleeper or arrays is taking place. We are having our Indian railway such machines. We are using it. So, we are using both the types. These are less because they are uh, costly also. Uh, and being purchased later, but the earlier one, which is the Plaza Skip Relay System, we are having so many. Okay, because that is cheaper. And even what we are doing is slowly, slowly we are outsourcing everything. The PQR portals which we saw, they are very cheap. So we are asking the contractor to bring the portals, do the work, and take a take away. We are not purchasing slowly, slowly. We are outsourcing everything. We don't want to maintain the inventory because if you maintain the inventory, you have to maintain it also. Isn't it? So we are putting most of the burden on the contractor. And since we have a lot of scope, contractors are willing to do. In your country, it may not be possible because the scope will be very less. During deep screening BCM, we are outsourcing. We are asking our data to bring the machine, which is costing around 30 crores of Indian rupees. 
T28 cranes should be positioned at demarcated places on existing turnout. <laughs> the gap between the two portal cranes should not be more than 25 meters. Both the cranes together have lifted the complete turnout. The old turnout to be dismantled is lifted by the T28 machines and brought to a predetermined suitable location, ensuring that it does not infringe the safe running of trains. <laughs> When they are picking up this turnout, they are moving on the crawlers. But they have also rail wheels. They can travel on the track also, but they cannot lift the load in this condition. The T28 cranes should be traversed to the previous yeah, seat and moving on the track and pushed out to the demarcated location on turnout. Now it has come to the new turnout through the portal place. This is a very old video. Scarified on level of ballast bed at the location from where the terminal has been removed. T28 cranes should hold the pre-assembled turnout and bring it to the location of laying by traversing across in stages and ensuring safe passage of trains. The total weight of one internal turnout is around 50 tons and these trains can lift around 60 tons. They have the capacity, total capacity. Each crane is having capacity of 30 tons. So 60 tons load they can lift and the turnout is weighing around 50 tons. There is another method. You have trolleys, you can load the turnout on the trolleys, also four trolleys, and you can cart it on the track. The other option is by picking up with the pony plate. <laughs> turnout should be laid and alignment should be corrected with the help of T28 machines. The new turnout is laid in position and the fish plates are bolted to the existing track. Track on approach of newly laid points should be attended, giving 25 mm ramp per 13 meter rail length if required. The turnout is interlocked and the point machine put in operation immediately after laying the turnout. The gang should fill back the ballast manually and pack the turnout. The complete turnout is now aligned, leveled and packed with off-track dampers or unimat machine to permit the train with the restricted speed. Unimat machine is 
The Unimed machine is required of course after putting the turnout because the ballast is loose. You have tested the ballast. The Unimed machine will be required and you open the section as 20 kb but if you have the animal flag stabilizer you can even open the section as 40 kb. So you can see that uh, how the renewal of the turnout is very clean, isn't it? If you do it manually, uh, you may have seen that it, it is very cumbersome. Removing rails, then removing sleepers, then ballast, leveling the ballast pad, then putting this, bringing each sleeper one by one takes a lot of time and energy, isn't it? And this process is very neat and clean. No damage to the uh, rails or sleepers, isn't it? And we have been using it for so many years, 30, 40 years, these, these machines. I myself has worked, uh, when I was in the section, I renewed 500 turnouts using these machines, 500, not one or two. <laughs> so I have got a lot of experience, I can explain how it works, how to assemble, where to assemble, how to carry all those things, but time is limited. Okay, so these uh, machines are used for renewal of the turnouts. Uh, then uh, on Indian Railways, we have uh, got another machine which is used for laying the new track. And it is a modification of your track link frame. In the track link frame, you are removing the existing track and putting the new track. But suppose uh, you uh, want to lay the new track. So, you have made the formation, you uh, lay, uh, lay the ballast pad, and over that you want to put the new track. So, these machines are used for laying the new track. So they are called new track construction machine. Now, these are the crawlers. This is similar to that machine, but only thing that nothing is being removed, only Sleepers, new sleepers are put in and new rails are uh, first unloaded and then they are brought inside. You can see the sleepers are being unloaded one by one. The sleepers, are, you can see they are uh, taking the sleepers and putting this there. And the rails are already there and just it is holding and bringing it in. From the drone, this photo uh, recording has been done. This is showing the complete rake. Uh, in the front portion, that machine is there. The rear portion, wagons are there where uh, bottom rails are you know, put and above that sleepers are kept. And there is some spacing is kept between rails and sleepers. So first rails are taken out, spread, and then the sleepers are laid. You can see these uh, wagons with the sleepers loaded and the bottom layer is having the rails. You can see the rails may be, may be visible. Okay. And these are the uh, overhead uh, portal plane which is moving or carrying the sleeper forward. Yes. And by the way, India and Railway has not purchased these uh, machines. Contractor has brought on its own. So, this is by LNT, Larson and Dubro company. Basically, the machine part is this much only. Is that the initial part? This is at the end, this is the only machine. Remaining is the other VFRs with other arrangements. Machine is only from here to here. This much only. You can see the rails have been unloaded initially by this dozer. It pulls the rail out from the uh, this uh, your, uh, uh, lake. It will pull out first the rails. It will put it on the rollers which are kept here. You can see. So it will pull out, put on the rollers and keep on dragging it. Already so much rails have been unloaded. This machine will be only putting the sleepers and bringing the rails in.
you can see the center line of the track has been marked. So the center line, which is respect to the center line, it will unload the sleepers. Can this job do by P twenty? P twenty eight actually we will do panel by panel only. So how will you change the rails? Then you have to change the rails also. A T twenty eight is basically you have to assemble the panel, pick it up, and put it here. Can uh, re uh, re uh, rails, rails uh, it cannot handle for long rail panels. Just panels have to be cut, which is not required. Or you bring service rails, you make the panels, bring the uh, PQRS portal or the T28 portal, lift it and keep one by one, then you have to again change the rails. You have to bring the rails and unload and then change it. But these machines will do both the things simultaneously. Putting the sleeper, putting uh, unloading the rails first, putting the sleepers and bringing the rails in. Okay. And these are also costly machines. Each machine may be costing 50 crores of Indian rupees. Mm -hmm. Sister contractor is bringing it. Because we are giving the scope. If you give the scope, what is the scope? He will bring. So he may be having 300, 400 kilometers of track uh, leg. So he will bring that machine. And with this machine, you can lay uh, a track of around 30 kilometers in one one, one kilometer per day. Suppose uh, you, you count uh, how much kilometer it is, it is doing? 20, 20, 20 kilometers. So in one month, this work will be completed. The laying of the track. Not, of course, the formation bridges have to be constructed. Once everything is ready, these machines will take one month to complete the work, track linking work. So easy, so quick. But of course, it is very costly. But, uh, no, I think, uh, Maybe, track of that can do, there is no issue. It is doing all types of, because the center line is marked, so it will put the three parts with respect to the center line. There is a center line marker point is there that has to coincide with that center line, that uh, chalk line. Okay, so you, uh, there is a control, remote control, you can uh, shift the machine so that the point, pointer contact with the center line. Okay. In the curve, you have to keep on shifting little, little. Okay. Check rail. Yeah. Check rail, you have to put that energy. Yeah. Uh, it will not put the check rail. You have to bring the check rail, just the holes and put the uh, check rails or in the sleeper, special sleeper. Uh, are also there for sitting the checkers. You can keep these sleepers in this machine and unload wherever required. Suppose in this stretch you want those sleepers, special sleepers. So accordingly, you feed that sleeper at that location. So those will be unloaded. You will feed the main lip, then you have to bring the checkers separately and fit on the sleepers. Okay. Similarly, uh, uh, guard rail sleepers also have to be brought for the player coaches, isn't it? So everything, uh, you can load those sleepers there and unload at that specific point. Progress is very fast, that is the only advantage. So uh, our Indian business is a dedicated freight corridor, uh, the uh, conductor is making 300 kilometers of track. So it is taking uh, 10 months, 10 to 12 months it is doing the work and going away. Then, of course, after making the formation, bridge, etc. So, uh, that 300 kilometers, uh, it is completing in five years, including formation, bridges, then track linking, everything in complete 300 kilometers in five years. Aircon may be taking also three, four years for 20 kilometers, isn't it? Yeah. So, it is very fast. Yeah. Another machine which we are using in Indian is the rail grinding machine. Pardon? Anything you want to discuss? Uh, these are the rail maintenance machine, rail grinding machine. So when the train is moving on the rail, there is wear and tear of the both the wheel flange as well as the rail head. So the rail profile changes. So the, the contact point of the wheel with the rail changes. Normally, uh, you should have center contact, isn't it? You want your wheel to touch the center of the rail. Suppose this is your rail head. 
You want your wheel to touch at this point. Isn't it? You want your wheel to touch at this point. But due to wear and tear, it may be touching uh, like this. Or maybe at this point. Which is not desired because the, then the load will not be coming at uh, the required point. If it is not flat, generally the rail head profile is something like this. The wheel will be touching at this point. Isn't it? But due to wear or what happens, the wheel may start touching somewhere here. So what happens? The rail is not designed for taking the load at this point because the stresses on the rail will be more than and rail flaws will start developing inside the rails and the rail may fail leading to fracture. So what you have to do is you have to reprofile the rail head so that your point of contact again shifts to the center or whatever location you want may not be center, may not may be somewhere here, may be near to the center, isn't it? So you have to reprofile the rail head. So you have to grind the rail head. So these rail grinding machines are there. Uh, they work. Uh, they grind the uh, rails. Uh, you will see the video later on. First we will try to discuss something. Reprofile the rail head. Taking into consideration of the profile of the wheel. Of course, wheel profile has to be taken into account. Because wheel will also getting worn out. So that. Wheel profile also needs to be measured. And generally what uh, we do is we take the weather, keep on weathering so many wheel profiles, take the average of that. And we assume this is my average wheel profile. And that average wheel profile, where will it touch the rail head? You have to see. Okay. Accordingly profile the rail head. So we have to optimize the rail wheel contact band, thereby making the rail wheel interaction favorable. Rail grinding results in removal of the surface defects. Because of the movement of the train, the surface, a lot of surface defects are coming. You might have seen on the rail top. So it removes those uh, surface defects. And it reduces the growth of the internal defects. Because uh, it shifts uh, the contact point to wherever it was desired. And it leads to the reduction of the rail wear. Other advantages are also there. One is the increased life of rail and wheel. On Indian railways, uh, our 60 kg rail was earlier having a life of 800 GMT. But after grinding, we have increased its life, uh, increased its, its life to 1000 GMT. Because we have improved the rail build profile, now the rear is less, stresses on the rail are less. So it can uh, be used for longer time. Improved reliability of the assets. The defect generation rate reduces to one-fourth after grinding. The generation rate of growth of defect reduces. Less tractive resistance. Because you have removed the surface defects, the surface becomes smooth. The tractive force required by the, in, by the force required by the engine to pull the train also reduces. Because the friction is reduced. So thereby saving in fuel consumption. Then improved reliability of USFD testing. You are testing the rails with the USFD method, ultrasonic flow detection. So the rays will not be able to penetrate if there are surface defects. So if you have removed the surface defect, the rays will, rays will penetrate inside the rail uh, and they will be able to check the internal defects easily or better. Reduce track geometry deterioration. Again, since you have removed the surface defect, rail wheel contact is improving, less stresses on the track, less disturbance to the track. So many advantages are there. Reduce the degradation of the balance. Of course, because of the smooth running, impact forces are less. So, balanced degradation is also less. Less noise, reduce derailment proneness. And these are the advantages we have seen on Indian railways. Rail life, as I said, increased from 800 GMT to 1000 GMT for 60 kg rails. Uh, fastening life ex gets extended by three times. Normally, the fastening, the life of the fastenings are for the PRC, PRC sleepers are around five years, isn't it? So, it can get three times. Means you can uh, uh, use this spreading for 15 years instead of five years. Then, sleeper life also gets extended by 20 percent. All this is happening because there are less, less stresses because of the smooth riding. Tamping cycle gets extended by 30 percent. Don't have to tamp 
Suppose you want uh, your tapping light now at every two years. So 30% increase means you may tap it after two and a half years. So that requirement of the machine reduces. By last cleaning also, requirement is less because as I said that due to the smooth running, the ballast degradation is low. So ballast cleaning is also requirement of ballast cleaning also gets reduced. Vehicle maintenance and wheel turning also improve because wear and tear of the wheel also reduces. So many advantages. Only the other content is it is costly. So, <coughs> <coughs> GMP is uh, gross million tons. Million. Million, uh, one million is uh, 10 lakhs. So, uh, 10 lakh tons. So, gross million tons means 800 uh, gross million tons traffic it can carry 60 kg earlier. Our life we have uh, defined. But now we have increased its life to 1000 GMT. It can run for more period. Okay. So, so many advantages, only the advantage I said that machine is costly and it is one of the costliest machines around costing around 50 crores of Indian rupees right now. I think the video is there at the back only. You will see now. Video. It is pulled by an uh, engine. Loram is being because Loram is getting on that engine. Loram company. It is spreading the water because the grinding is producing that spark. So that spark can catch the fire. So initially it is spreading the uh, water, then it is grinding the fire being done. Then again the water is spread after that so that any fire, anything catching fire, it will be extinguished. With a complete uh, rain, small rain, which is doing the grinding. And there, there are stones for grinding, and they have to uh, be oriented accordingly. So, the rubbing action is called causing the spark. Yeah. <laughs> On Indian Railways, uh, right now we are having uh, around two to three, machi three machines and we are purchasing uh, nine more. Mm -hmm. We have already discussed. Okay, we will now discuss these three types of machines which are material handling machines. You can see the, that this is a UTV machine, this is RBMB and this is MPT machine. Three machines we will discuss one by one. This UTV uh, is called utility vehicle. In short, we call it a UTV. And it is a small machine with a small crane and a BRM or a BFR is attached to this machine. So this crane, what it will do? Suppose the material is lying on the side, it can pick up that material and put in this BRM. So, you can load sleepers, rails, etc. from your depot, load it into the bearer, take it to the side, then unload using these cranes. It becomes very easy to take, uh, carry the material from track to track. Isn't it? So, these uh, cranes uh, are coming in different capacities of 1 and 1.5 ton, 2 ton, 3 ton at 7.5 meter radius. So, if it is closer, it, uh, of course, the capacity is more. Then rail board maintenance vehicles. This uh, this is a, a, like a machine itself. Uh, what it does is it, it also has this small crane and the space for uh, storing the material. And it has got two cabins. One cabin is for putting the small track machines and one cabin for carrying the men. This labor can go sit, sit in this uh, machine. Labor with all the material it will go to the side to uh, load the material, do the work, uh, load back, come back. Okay. So, you don't require any uh, road vehicle for carrying the materials, men and materials. So, this, uh, this component was shown, cable for material, crane, cable for men. 
and this is a multi purpose chamber which we discussed uh, initially also multi purpose chamber camper it can it is generally used for spot attention of plane track and turnout with it can train and plane track as well as turnout and also carry man and material so it is basically rpmv machine plus your tamping machine combination of the two so it is a most advantageous machine you can carry man and material uh, you can do the tamping everything in one machine you can see this machine is having this tamping portion and there, there is small uh, wagon arrangement which is a part of this machine itself and it has got the small crane and the space for storing the material so this crane can pick up the material and store it in there and it can carry and people can be seated in this uh, cable and uh, when you go to the side unload the material if you want to do tamping you do the tamping then uh, load the release material come back okay so this is the most uh, advantageous machine the only drawback is that uh, the performance of this machine is not as good as the other tamping machines because the strength of the power is less slightly than other machines okay and it has also got the lc in it the new machines are also got the computer for tamping purpose we'll see this for that part lc part and it is relatively cheaper not very costly now coming to the small track machine there are various small track machine which are you being used you might also be uh, using one is a rail cutting machine or this is a abrasive rail cutting machine with a disc arrangement it can it cuts the rail in two and a half to three minutes rather if you have a xo arrangement it takes 12 to 15 minutes isn't it but it takes two, two to three minutes the abrasive cutting disc Then we have the hold, hold uh, rail hold drilling machine. This this is the tow load gathering device. It will hold to the RC, pull, pull it up, and as soon as the gap is slight gap is created, it means that the RC the yeah uh, nasty rail clip has been lifted. So that will give you the recording how much load was required to lift it up. So that is the tow load of the RC. And these are the hydraulic jacks. You can have mechanical jacks, hydraulic jacks for lifting the track, and there are other machines also. I'm not sure, like track lifting and consuming device. You can put it under the under the track. It will lift the track. It will slow the track, and then you can do it. Okay. Then there are off track tempers which is which was shown. People uh, with a uh, off track tamper tracking the track. So all those are small track machines which are assisting the track maintenance. Are you going for that? That is the tow load measuring device. For measuring the tow load, what is the load which is your elastic rail clip is exerting on the liner or on the rail? So uh, it is defined. The value is defined. Suppose you have ERC mark three or my ERC mark five. The tow load is defined. Uh, this much is the tow load. How to ascertain that tow load is coming or not? You should have some device to measure it. And For Eldorado track, tow load is one of the important thing. Your tow load should never be more than less than 400 kg. How to how will you ensure that this tow load is there unless until you measure it? Generally, on Indian railways, we are measuring one percent of the sleepers. Every hundred sleeper, one on one sleeper, we are measuring the tow load for all the four ERCs. You take out of hundred sleeper, one sleeper. Measure the tow load of all the four ERCs, and again next hundred sleeper, one sleeper will take. Measure the tow load of all the four ERCs, and this tow load measurement is uh, done every year. So as to ascertain why my tow load is proper, I don't need whether I need to change it or not, because the behavior of the elder floor will change if the tow load is less. The rail will start moving over the sleeper because of the uh, thermal stresses. Okay. So this is another important machine, which will ensure, uh, which will uh, give you how much is the tow load, the ERP. Okay. Now SNT signal and telecom engineer has also to, uh, a lot of role to play during the working of these machines. Uh, for plane track tamping machines, those rollers are there which are holding the rails. Roller type arrangement, which are holding the rail, 
and lifting the track, lifting the track, slowing the track, isn't it? So your roller rollers should keep on moving. There should be no obstruction in the movement of the rollers. So for that, you need to open the joggle plate, etc. And if any SNT signal and telecom equipment is placed on the rail, that also needs to be removed, like your axle counters. If they are there. Opening of the axle counters. I think you may be having these axle counters. Suppose these axle counters are fixed. They are generally used for ascertaining whether they are full trained as far or not. They are counting the axles of the train and generally fixed on the yard. So, if the train passes, the number of X, they are, these exit counters are fitted in the beginning of the station and the end of the station. So, when the train enters, this exit counter will count the number of axles which have been, which have passed on it. Then, this exit counter again will count the axles of the train and both should match. If both are matching means train has completely uh, moved ahead. Otherwise, if the both are, there is a difference, it means that there is some train party. So these axle counters are put on the track for counting the axles. And if the tempering machine is coming, you can see that the roller will not work at this location. We are not able to work at these locations. So they have to be removed. So for the packing one. Okay. Opening or protecting the cables passing through the track. Uh, your uh, machine is tamping the at the rail seat. So if there are cables in that portion, they have to be removed. And then refilled after the tamping work. So these cables, etc. You can see that suppose this is the cable, the tools will come, they will tools will hit this one. So this arrangement has to be removed. And cables should be ideally like this. These cables are not going to affect the Tamping operation. What tamping tools will be coming here, tamping here, here. And these cables are over the sleeper, so it is okay. So this is the ideal arrangement for the cables. So that there is no shifting requirement when the tamping machine has come for the tamping bar. For the working of the Unimed machine, that is which is tamping the turnout, or the BCM machine which is GP screening, again. You have to, uh, SNT engineer is required for disconnection memory. He has to disconnect the point machine. <laughs> then it removes the rods. So point machine has to be removed, ground connections have to be opened. We saw that ground connection, those roddings, they have to be opened and they are opened by the signal, signal engineer. These rods have to be opened for the working of Unimed and VCM machines on turnout. And if your track is electrified, then there is a role of electrical engineer as well. I think in your country it is not electrified. Or Indian railways, we have most of the track as electrified. You can see it right on the back side. So the role of electrical engineer is also there when the machine is coming. Actually, uh, these overhead equipment, they are installed at a these poles are installed at a uh, certain distance, and these wires are installed at a particular height. So those two have to be maintained. And you suppose your machine is coming and slewing the track or lifting the track, both the distances will change. So your uh, uh, electrical engineer person uh, should be there to check whether those dimensions are not reduced beyond their uh, minimum values. Normally this value for Indian railways we are keeping around 3 meters from the track center to this pole. Suppose it becomes less than 3 meters then you will say no it is not possible. Or you generally what they do is you tell them, yeah, I have planned my swing of the track at this point, at uh, this much to the towards the pole, this much away from the pole. So you will say whether it is possible or not. Okay, at this much lifting we are planning at these, these locations. And if you say, okay, it is possible, but I have to adjust my height. Height part they can adjust, but lateral, laterally nothing can be done. The height adjustment is possible. Suppose this height is getting reduced because of the lifting of the track, they can lift those wires, but then we again need disconnection for the Ochi. This is uh, 25 kV, 25 kilo volt. Electric current is uh, running on that. If anybody 
by mistake touches, he will be charged to death immediately within no time. 25 kilo volt. Yeah. 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 You can lift the track, but this has to be lifted. There is an arrangement. There is some margin for lifting. Why can't they get it for that? Yeah. Yeah. This can be lifted. Actually, this arrangement, in this arrangement, this arrangement can be lifted up. If it is there, it can be lifted a little bit up. There is an arrangement. Okay. But for that, they have power wagons. Specially designed wagon where they can climb on that and do that adjustment. But they have to take the power block, they have to shut down that uh, electricity, uh, say 25,000 volts. So uh, they have to shut, uh, shut it down, adjust that, and then they will allow the train to pass. Okay. So, so this is called overhead equipment. So the arrangement is called overhead equipment. OH in short. So, as the OH clear to be checked before and after the block, uh, as damping machine shifts and lifts the track, and inform the location of lifting and swing, uh, the, the electrical person will inform you. At this location, you cannot shift, you cannot lift, because I don't have the margin. If he has the margin, he will allow you, otherwise he will not allow. So, whatever we have discussed yesterday and today, we will just sum up. Uh, we discussed the various types of track machines, on-track machines as well as off-track machines. We mainly focus on on-track machines. Uh, so for better quality and output of track construction as well as maintenance, we are using these machines. Uh, various on-track machines which we discussed were the tamping machines, the last handling machines, rail grinding machines, track renewal machines, and material handling machines, etc. And Certain off track machines like rail cutting machines, rail cutting machines, tool load machine device, track jacks, etc. Okay, so so many machines are being used and they are required because our track structure is becoming heavy with the introduction of PNC sleepers. And of course, for raising the speed, you don't have the option. And since you don't have the wooden sleepers because of the scarcity of wood, of course, you don't have the options other than to go to the PNC sleepers. Then, so PNC sleepers. You have to go and they are heavy, so you have to use the machines. Otherwise, these sleepers, uh, if you are trying to handle with a man, they will damage your sleeper. And even the rails, rails are also to be handled very carefully. Although they may appear to be very strong, but a lot of internal flaws are generated when you are mishandling them. Okay. So, uh, we, are, we are told, uh, we, we teach the our engineer that you have to lift or you have to handle the rails as if you are handling the glass. Glass you have to, everybody says handle with care. Like that, you have to handle the rails with care. Also, they seem to be very strong. Mm -hmm. But the mishandling results in a lot of internal stresses being generated, a lot of internal flaws getting generated which weakens the rail. You may not be able to see visually, but inside, a lot of defects might be created. Very small, and they will slowly grow and break the rail. Okay. So, handle with care. So, we will uh, close this part of the track machine. We will take a uh, small bit, uh, this much bit, and six, six and a half, six and a half feet length, so that you can see. In your country, that may not be required because that is very small. Our country is very large. Mm -hmm. So, people have to travel. Uh, suppose uh, somebody has to go from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, which is near uh, country. It will take uh, more than two days to travel. Yeah. So how, how will you uh, go? You need to you need sleep. You need bus. Okay. So two means comfortable because sufficient space will be there, you can easily sit, you can sleep, whatever you feel like. Three means little bit congested, you have to uh, fold a middle one, so that the person sitting at the bottom can sit easily. Yeah. yeah, sleeper coaches are there which are without AC, then they are AC, uh, is out of there, AC two tire, AC three tire, or AC tire. We have chair car also, uh, chair car without AC, with AC, everything, so many variations. Then we have first AC also. 
Perception of again two birds. Uh, one of the other birds which is more more comfortable. And on the sides of the some birds are there in two tier, three tier. But in first city, no, nothing on the side. Only in the uh, front and the cabin are there. You can close the cabin and sleep like your home. Okay. Because that is required because you have to tra travel so much distance. Yes. Uh, because from the top to bottom, 3,000 kilometers. More than 3,000 kilometers. But somebody has to travel 3,000 kilometers. Then, yes, of course, the two nights will come in between. So, yes, you have to sleep in the night. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, landing and leveling we will discuss now. Actually, uh, now let us concentrate on the uh, technical topic. So, lining and leveling. That is the correction of alignment and correction of, correction of the levels by tampering machines. Okay. How the machine corrects? What are the principles involved? We will try to discuss. So, objective of this session is to uh, that at the end of the session, we may be able to define basic principle of lining and leveling by tempering machine. What is the principle involved in correction of the alignment and level by the tempering machine? And work in design mode, including use of ELC. How uh, you can work in the design mode and uh, how the design mode will be, uh, you will work using ELC, that is automatic guiding computer, which is installed in, a, in your machine. How will you use that computer to get uh, good quality of landing and leveling? So first we will discuss the landing of the track, that is correction of alignment using tablet machine. Uh, this principle uh, we need to keep in mind that landing, leveling and tamping mechanism <coughs> which we are discussing it, it is applicable to all types of tamping machines, whether it is a uh, plane track tamping machine or turnout tamping machine, whether it is with a third line unit, without third line unit, single sleeper tamper or two sleeper or two three sleeper tamper, principle involved is same in all the machines. Okay. Lining what we are trying to achieve, we are trying to bring the track back to the original laid alignment, isn't it? We try to bring the track in lining with correction of alignment, we, we try to bring the alignment of the track to what it was laid initially. But sometimes this question mark is there so that because most of the time we are not aware what was my original alignment, isn't it? We don't know because we don't have the records. Where was my original alignment? So what we try to do is, we try to achieve some desired alignment, which is very good, isn't it? Some desired alignment, which we plan. And, if not possible, if this alignment is also not possible, what we are doing is, we are trying to smoothen the tire, so as to limit the station to station variation of our sign. Normally, this is an intermediate stage. Suppose we are trying to bring to this desired alignment, but it is involving lot of swing, lot of lifting. We are not able to do it in one go. So we try, at least try to reduce the variation in the Versailles. Do you know what is Versailles? Everybody? How do we measure the curve? We measure the curve by Versailles. We stretch the cord, we measure the Versailles with the scale. So that variation we are limiting. In a scale, all the Versailles are zero. In curve track, circular portion, it is uniform, some value. In transition portion, they are varying. Okay. So, what we try to achieve, we try to reduce the variation in the Versailles so that the running is good. And finally, so finally we try to achieve this desired alignment. Okay. Maybe not in one goal, there are two times, three times we are tempting and trying to bring it to the desired alignment. Now, coming to the method of lining, there are two methods by which the lining uh, is done by the machine. One is the four point lining, another is three point lining. Four and three indicate the number of trolleys in the machine which are used for the lining purpose. As I said, there are four trolleys, front trolley, landing trolley, measuring trolley, rear trolley. If you are using all the four trolleys, we are doing the work in four point lining. And if you are not using the rear trolley and using only three trolleys, 
or any other trolley in between also can be mixed depending upon the manufacturer or your plant. So if you are using only three trolley, it is a three point line. But four and three is a completely different method. The principle involved in both the methods are completely different. We will try to understand what is the four point lining method and what is the three point lining method. The systems are different. The working system of the machine changes. Okay. This we have already seen. Uh, in the four point lining system, what we are doing, we are using all the four trolleys for the lining purpose. Your cord is tied between the rear trolley and the front trolley, and in between. What we are doing is, uh, the cord is stand between center point of rear and front trolley and is used as the reference for selection of alignment. And in the middle two trolleys, we have the Verthine transducer. Okay. The Verthine is brown color. These are the Verthine transducer which are measuring the Verthine at these two locations. Okay. So now let us try to understand the principle of the lining. Machine measures the alignment of only one pre-selected reference rail and rectifies the alignment. With out of the two rails, it will select one rail first and it will correct the alignment of this rail. What happens to the other rail? The other rail is fixed with a sleeper. So its alignment will automatically get corrected except for the gauge defect. If the gauge is not uniform, the reference rail alignment will be perfect and the gauge defect will appear on the non-reference rail. Okay. And alignment is corrected by correcting the size. As we saw, there we have percent transitions in the measuring trolley and lining trolley. They are measuring the size. And by measuring the size, the alignment is corrected. You see how it is corrected. Versailles on the straight track are zero, whereas on the curve track, the Versailles depends upon the radius of the curve, chord length for measurement, and location of measurement. This we will see in detail how it changes. The Versailles are, are not constant. They change with the radius of the curve, they change with the chord length, and they change with the location of measurement. You see, try to see. Suppose this is a curve of radius r, and we stretch a cord AB, and if you suppose we measure the Versailles at the center, the Versailles is even, isn't it? Suppose you take another cord CD, and you will again measure the Versailles at the center, the Versailles is different. Although the same curve is there, but if you are changing the cord, then Versailles is changing. So here, CD is greater than AB, the cord length is more, so Versailles is more. Cord length is small, Versailles will be small for the same curve. Okay. <coughs> Suppose you are using 20 meter cord or one chain length, Versailles will be different. If you are using half the chain length or 10 meter, the Versailles will be different, it will be less. So, higher the cord length, higher the Versailles for the same curve. Now, Suppose you measure the Versailles at this location. So, this Versailles, V3, will be less than V1. Same cord length, but you are measuring the percent at some other location. That will be different. Of course, if you change the curve itself, all, every, all the values are going to change. So, Versailles are dependent upon the radius of the curve, cord length, and location of measurement. Okay. Why we are discussing this? Because each machine has a different cord length, and the location of measurement is different in each machine. If you take two machines, one is a Unimed and the other is a Duomatic, both the machines have different cord length, they have trolley locations at different points, so they are measuring the percent at different locations. So no two machines will have the same percent value for the same curve, they will have different percents. For the same curve, one machine comes, it will have some other percent value for the same radius of curve, other machine, if you bring some other machine, the percent will be different. Okay, because third length is different, location of measurement is different. Okay, if these trolley distances are not fixed, they are varying with each machine. For a machine, it is fixed, but if you bring some other machine, those trolley distances are different. 
Okay? Is it clear or not? Now coming to the reference rail. On a curved track, which rail should be selected as the reference rail? Hmm. Oh, oh. High rail. Why? Oh, oh. Oh, oh. Is that any reference Yeah, very good. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sinav, I have not have looked down very much. Uh, so, you have rightly said, your outer wheel is touching the outer rail. When the speed is high, so you want your high speed trains to run very smoothly, isn't it? So it means that the outer rail alignment should be very good. So you choose the outer rail or the higher rail as the reference rail so that that alignment, the alignment of that rail is corrected perfectly. And whatever the other gauge defects, they are appearing only on the lower rail, where the wheel is not touching the rail. Is that it? Very good. So, outer rail preferably, but uh, any other rail can be taken as a There is no hard and fast rule. Suppose you have perfect gauge. Doesn't matter. Whatever, whichever rail you are choosing as a reference rail. Once you correct the alignment of one rail, the alignment of the other rail will also be perfect. Isn't it? So, it depends upon whether you have how good the gauging is. Okay. On a straight track, any of the straight two rails which appears to you as less disturbed, so that the effort in correction of the alignment is less. Okay. Now we will discuss about the four point line. So this is the this is the under frame of the machine. The direction of movement is from left to right. Yes, sir. Yeah. The is implying. Inclined that is curved. Gradient. Gradient. Doesn't change. Doesn't matter. There is no issue of the gradient. It can be level or gradient. The principle remains the same. No change. Suppose this is the under frame of the machine. These are the four trolleys. Front trolley, landing trolley, nursery trolley, rear trolley. This is the axle of the uh, this machine. There is nothing to do with the trolleys. The four trolleys are there. Then you have Versailles transducer, which is fixed on this mezzanine trolley and the landing, landing trolley, and it looks like this one. Okay. And for uh, this Versailles transducer, any difference between the cord location and the center of this transducer is the Versailles. Suppose the cord is coinciding with the center of this transducer, Versailles is zero. The cord is at some other location, the difference is zero over sign. So the difference between the cord location and the center of the term is the sign. Okay. Suppose you select this left lane as a reference rail, direction movement is from left to right. So this rail is your, uh, suppose this you take as a reference rail. So all the trolleys will be pushed towards that reference rail because you want to find the alignment of that rail. Okay. So there are uh, air pressure system which will push these trolleys towards the reference rail. So uh, if you take the curve track, this will be the position. These trolleys, they are here, four trolleys. The center of these trolleys will be coinciding with the center of the track. But look at the cord. Cord is tied, tied only at the front trolley and the rear trolley. So it will be straight like this. So these transducers will measure this gap between this cord location and the center. So they what they are uh, measuring? They are basically measuring the birth signs at two different locations. Isn't it? How do you measure the birth sign? You stretch the cord. Then you measure the this gives the difference between the cord and the curve. Same thing is happening here. So these transducers are measuring the birth signs at two uh, two locations where they are provided. Okay. And we call them as H2 and H1. The Versailles which is measured by the Mazen trolley, we say it as H2, and Versailles which is measured by the Mazen trolley, we call it as H1. Now we need to have some relationship between H1 and H2 because you cannot have two different Versailles for the same curve. 
So generally we establish a relationship and that relationship is generally fed in the, is a, by default in the software it is fed. So what is that relationship we will try to see. So we, uh, our curves are circular curves. So we will uh, use the property of the circle to find out the relationship between the two or signs. Suppose this is the circle of radius R and AD is the chord. Here A is a real trolley, G is a measuring trolley, this C is a learning trolley and D is a front trolley. Okay, reverse direction we are numbering. And we are measuring the Versailles at measuring trolley H2 and learning trolley as H1. Okay, from the property of the circle, we know if the two chords are intersecting each other, the product of their components are equal. It means that if this AD and this vertical diameter, they are two chords which are intersecting each other, product of H1 into 2R minus H1 would be equal to AC into CD. Something like this. From the property of the circle. Normally, our H1 versine is very small as compared to your 2R. Suppose you have 1 degree curve. The radius of the 1 degree curve is 1750 meters. So, 2R will be 3500 meters. And the Versailles on a 20 meter chord, H1 is 28.5 millimeters. So, 3500 meters, 28.5 millimeters. Huge difference. So, you can easily neglect H1 as compared to 2R. So, that our equation becomes simple. So, uh, this equation becomes H1 into 2R equal to AC into CD or H1 is equal to AC into CD upon 2R. So, the value of Versailles is dependent upon the location of the trolleys, the distance AC and CD, and of course the radius. Similarly, you can derive the relationship for H2 as AB into BD upon 2R on the same analog. Okay. And if you take the ratio of the two, 2R, 2R will cancel out. And this ratio will be equal to AC into CD upon AP into BD. And these are the trolley distances which are fixed for a machine. It means for a machine, the ratio of the two versines is fixed. If the trolley distances are fixed, this value is fixed. So the ratio of the two versines is fixed. Okay. And we call it as a versine ratio. So versine ratio is fixed for a machine. Or from this you can work out H1 is equal to I times H2. It means that if H2 is not, you can work out H1 by simply multiplying with the I which is constant for that machine. Okay? Is that clear or not? So the ratio of the two versines, you can see here, it is independent of the curve radius. Isn't it? These AC, CD, AB, BD have nothing to do with the radius of the curve. So, the ratio of the two versines is independent of the curve radius. It means that these two versine ratios are same. Suppose this is 1 mm, this is 2 mm. So, this ratio is 2 is to 1, isn't it? This is 2, this is 1. Suppose this becomes 2, so this will become 4. The ratio will remain the same. Sharper the curve, if the curve is sharp, both will increase. If the flat, curve is flatter, both will reduce. But the ratio will remain the same. Okay. That is an important property. Okay. Is that clear? The Versailles ratios for different machines are given here. For unomatic machine it is 1.33. For diomatic machine it is 1.315. The ratio between the two Versailles. Because the trolley distances are varying as I said. For each machine, uh, this ratio is fixed. But it is different from the other machine. So these are the ratios of the Versailles. Around 1.3, slightly vary because there is slight variation in the trolley distance. Okay. Like Unimat, it is different. For CSM, it is different. For Tempting Express, it is different. For MPT, it is different. For all machines, the ratio is different, but it is fixed for that machine. Okay. Now let us understand how the machine corrects the alignment. Okay. Suppose you have an ideal curve, say the uh, curve with uniform radius, and there is an alignment error 
at one location. Okay. Now I will put the machine in such a way that our rear trolley A, the metal trolley B, and the front trolley D, they are on the ideal curve, on the correct curve. Okay. And the alignment error is only at the location of the landing trolley where percent H1 is being measured. So what machine will do? Machine will measure the percent H2. Okay. Then it will calculate its own H1 by the formula H1 is equal to I times H2. So it will machine will calculate I1 H1 is equal to I times H2. So machine will measure this percent H2. Multiply with the I and get its own H1. But machine is also measuring this H1 percent which is coming here. This green is your ideal curve and this black here is your disturbed track. So if since your uh, trolley A, B and D are on the ideal track, your H2 is perfect. Isn't it? Because the three points are good points. Your H2 is correct. So your H1 will be corresponding to the ideal track which is at the green location. But the machine whatever it measuring will be only this one, this small value. So both H1 are different. The H1 measured by the machine and the H1 which machine is calculating by this formula. So what machine will do? Machine will slew the track till the method H1 becomes equal to stress H1. Okay. What machine has done? Machine has method H2 calculated its own value of H1 by multiplying by I. So it knows that this is my ideal H1. But in the field, because of this alignment error, the actual H1 is coming in lesser. So what will machine will do? Machine will slew the track till this method H1 becomes equal to I times H2. Okay. If this alignment was outside, it means that H1 would have been more than I times H2. So it will slew the track inside. Still, the H1 which is measured by the machine becomes <laughs> equal to high times H2. Is that clear or not? Everybody? The whole machine is correcting. It is measuring H2 and correcting H1. Okay. So, in order to correct H1, your H2 should be correct. It means and H2 is measured by, by stretching the cord between A and D and measuring at B. It means all these three points should be good points. Normally, your tamping unit uh, and lifting and landing unit, your lifting and landing unit which is correcting the alignment is near this landing trolley C. It means that this rear portion has already been attended by the machine. So, normally, your A and B will be uh, have, have already been corrected, so you can assume that they are on the good track or the desired alignment, isn't it? Machine has already attended that part, rear part, so that is good, you can assume. But this part has not been attended by the machine. So D point may be on a good track, may not be on a good track, may be on a disturbed track, isn't it? The location of uh, the, point, the point D, your curve may be good or bad, isn't it? You don't know. But A and P is known because machine has already attended that part. So normally what I said, so I have written all these things which I have already discussed. So normally this is the case, isn't it? Your ideal curve is around the green one. And when the machine is jumping, it has already attended this part. So this part is correct. But this all is disturbed. Alignment is disturbed. Isn't it? So, D, it should have been like this. At this point. Isn't it? If your track was correct. It was along the green one. Your D point instead of here, it should have been here. So, your H2 should have been this smaller. But now, the H2 is coming more than what the actual H2 should be there. Isn't it? Because D has shifted inside. So, if your H2 is wrong, what, what will happen to H1? Will it be okay or wrong? Oh. It will also be wrong, oh. isn't it? So, what will happen? It, it will correct as per this calculated H2, uh, H2 into I, it will do and work out its own H1 and it will not bring the track to this green location. 
because they are not the calculated H1 is not the desired H1. Okay. Let us try to see uh, in detail. I have enlarged that part. This is my AP and this third portion is uh, the disturbed track. So, your existing track is like this, coming here and going like this. Whereas, the target position is this. This is your desired track alignment, where you want your track to be. Isn't it? So, now what is happening? Your chord is like this. Because, D point has come here, whereas ideally it should have been here. So, this, this should have been your desired chord location. If D was also on the perfect curve, it would have been here and chord should have been along the red one. But now chord has shifted to the green location. Isn't it? Are you able to follow? So, what is happening? Suppose FD is the error in the location of the front trolley. X is the for front and D is the trolley number. So, error at the front trolley. This is the error in the track alignment at the front trolley location. Because of this error, there is an error in H2 which is this one. Isn't it? Because the location has shifted downward. So, at this point, this is the error in the first H2. Isn't it? Because of this error in H2, the curve will be smoothed to this location and not to the desired location. Okay. And what is this error value? This error value can be expressed as a fraction of the front trolley error. You can derive the relationship. And for a CSL machine, this value comes as around 6. There is a formula to calculate this uh, FT. This error is FD upon N. A fraction of this error. And this n value, the formula is AD into PDF on AC into DC. This has been calculated. So, this value for a CSM machine is 6. So, it means that whatever is error is there at the front trolley location, one sixth error will be left at this planning trolley location when the machine is slowing the track. So, because of the front trolley location, track will not be shifted to the desired location. Okay. Is it clear or not? But how to remove this error? Suppose you slew, give the slew at this point. Means you shift this chord from green location to the red location like this. Suppose. Suppose you know what is the disturbance at this location. And at the front of, from the front cabin, there is the option of slewing the chord at this location. So, suppose you slew the chord and bring it over here. If you know this FD value, what will happen? Because of this link, this error is gone. Error in the H2 is gone. If the error in H2 is gone, you will get the correct H2, you will get correct H1 and your track will be slewed to the desired geometry or the target geometry. Okay. Otherwise, it will not. So, for correcting the track alignment, you should know at each and every point what is the difference between my existing track and my desired track location. And you keep on giving the slew equal to that value at each and every point. It may be different at each, uh, each point, isn't it? It means that suppose this is your existing track. Okay. Like this. And suppose this is my desired track, smooth curve. So it means that every location you should know what is my FD value. It will be, this will be towards the outside. Here it will be towards the inside, isn't it? It will be towards that ideal curve. So at every point you need to measure it and feed it from the front cable. If you keep on feeding the slew value, you will keep on getting the correct location of chord, you will keep getting correct value of H2, you will keep getting correct value of H1, your track will come to the desired alignment. Okay. Here, the beauty is that you don't have to feed any radius because 
once you slew it to that location, machine has inbuilt ratio, correction ratio of S2 and H1, it will correct the alignment without having any requirement for radius. Huh? The radius is not required to be given. It will come to the curve, it knows S2, uh, uh, because you have put the uh, steel to a correct point, you have slewed that to the correct point, so it knows, it measures the S2, correct S1. Doesn't need any radius. Okay, so in 4.9 system, we don't have to put the radius of the curve for the one side. Is it clear or not? This part? Yeah, so that, that part we will discuss now. Okay. Uh, so uh, for different machines, the error. The n value is different. That is, the error which is left at the line trolley is Ft upon n. And the n value may be 6 or 5 or 7.6. Means, if you take this Unimed 3S machine, the error will be Ft upon 7.62. If there is Ft error at the front trolley, the error left at the line trolley will be Ft upon 7.62. Ft upon 7.62 is less than it. Then uh, Fd by 6, the so Unimed 3R will be having a better alignment. Less error will be left by, the, by that machine. Okay. Let us try to understand that, then we will come to your point. So, uh, suppose there is an alignment error of x value at a certain point. Due to this alignment error, this uh, god has shifted away. So, H2 will be now different than the ideal H2. Then H1 will be I times S2 and your curve will become like this. So error at this point is X by 6 approximately as we took for CSF. For the unit of code, it will be less. So what is happening is that whenever there is an error, X error at the front only, X by 6 error is, or X by 6 or X by 7 error will be left at the line and trolley. This curve was perfect at this location. But because of this error, alignment error is occurring at this point. So machine tapping, what it is doing, it is taking the error from some other location and putting somewhere else. Isn't it? Of course, the value is less. Isn't it? There was an alignment error over here, and because of this error, some alignment error has come at this point where the track was already good. And now the track has been disturbed. So we are trying to understand what is the importance of giving the slew and bringing the front trolley to the correct location. If you don't give, this will happen. And, but this is not the end of the story. When the machine moves forward, what will happen? We will see. Just see. When the machine moves forward and this bedroom trolley comes at this location, at the RR location, your H2 is wrong. Earlier we were assuming that our A and B points have been corrected by the machine. So their alignment are good. But here in this case, since the alignment error was left by the machine here, this error will be picked up by this method trolley. So H2 itself becomes wrong. When the H2 becomes wrong, H2, H1 will, always, will, always, will also be wrong. Again, one more error is coming here. Isn't it? What will happen when this method trolley comes here? Again, H2 will be wrong. Again, some error will be left. So a single error is creating small, small alignment errors. Isn't it? And this is not doing good to your track. Isn't it? Like this, it will keep on happening. So one big error is removed, but a small, small alignment errors will be created. If you are not giving the slew. Is it okay or not? Are you able to follow this part? Yes. A single error, alignment error in the track, if not corrected by giving the sloop, will create a number of small, small alignment errors. So what you have to give is like this, which I will, uh, which I have drawn. So you need to know what is my existing alignment of the track and what is my desired alignment. And what is the difference at each and every point? So you have to keep on giving the slew at each and every point so that your front trolley is moving on the correct location 
the rear trolleys will also be getting the alignment at this landing trolley will also be getting corrected. So B A B point will be on the good track. D you are correcting it. So always H two will be correct. H one will also be correct. Okay. Now the your question: How to find the slew value? Okay. Slew value is nothing but the difference between the existing track and the desired track. Isn't it? So F D is the difference between the existing curve and the desired track or desired curve. There are different methods to calculate the difference. One is the reference point. Another is the desired alignment. What is the difference point? Whenever we are laying the curve in the field in the field, what we are putting? We are putting some reference points on the outside, parallel to our desired curve. Whenever we are laying the track curve in the field. During construction stage, we are putting this track, say, at two meter from the desired center line of the track. Then you lay the curve. Suppose now your existing track is red, sorry, black, and your ideal track is uh, is green. Suppose now you measure what is the distance between the existing track and this reference track. Suppose it comes as two point one meter. That means that by point one meter or ten centimeters, my track has slowed. Away from the desired alignment, isn't it? At the level, so you can get that value. What is the slope required at this point? Closer to these peaks, the accuracy will be more, isn't it? But this is this you can do only if you have reference peaks, isn't it? But if you don't have reference peaks, this will not work. What is the other method? So here it is written F D is A dash minus A. A dash is the actual distance from the uh, uh, reference track, and A is the ideal one. So the difference will give you the slope. The other thing is the desired alignment. With the help of the total station, suppose you know what is my center line coordinates of the desired track. Suppose initially when we did the construction stage, somebody has put the curve, and with the total station. Uh, first, you have to fix a benchmark whose coordinates are known. With the help of that benchmark, you transfer it to the track, so you know the track center coordinates. And for the ideal track, if you know the center line coordinates in terms of northing, easting, and z value, this gives in terms of northing, easting, and z. This total station gives in three three uh, things. So the northing, easting will give you the x coordinate. And Z will give you the vertical coordinate. So the square, the coordinate of the point in the space will be known. So the if you know these center line coordinates, which are shown as cross lines, then you go to the field currently and you again measure what is my center line coordinates for the existing track. The difference of the two will give you the slope. And there are softwares which can convert these northing and easting into X and Z values. X values and existing X uh, proposed one difference it will find out and it will give you the two direct things. Okay, and that difference will give you the lift amount of lift required to be given. Okay, is it clear or not? This is the like, this is this should be the actual method. Your know, recon should you should also ask the recon to give the center line coordinates in terms of north and east and that so that whenever in future you are serving. You know the existing coordinates, and the difference will give you the smooth. Okay. And there is another method of finding the uh, smooth is by the smooth chart, by the realignment of the curve. Have you heard uh, learned about the realignment of the curve? Do you know that? Have you heard the string line method or realignment of curve? String line method. There is a string line method for realignment of the curve. So this method uses the existing vertices of the curve, and you propose some vertices for the ideal curve, and there is a method to calculate the slope. 
Okay. So this will give you the snooze at different points. Generally at each station. Generally your stations are 10 meter apart, half the chain length, isn't it? So at both points you will get the slew and in between you can interpolate. it. The both slew at this point uh, is say at this point is it say 10 mm and at the next station it is say 5 mm. So in between you can interpolate uh, it as linearly. It may not be linear but you can assume. But there are uh, now surveyors which are coming with the Trimble trolley. They continuously measure the alignment of the track. Then they can give you at every meter or every 2 meter or every 3 meter or every 5 meter. But whatever distance you desire, the accuracy will be more. Okay. So the string line method, I will just show you. I will not uh, uh, I'll just brief you uh, how it works. May not be able to teach you, but at least inform you. Okay. <coughs> Computer is also slack. Too much burden for your head. uh, this is the string line method. It is given in the this table. We will try to see. Again, there is some issue with the software. I'll enlarge it here, okay? It is taking some time. <laughs> I think it is, it is selling that it is sufficient for today. Two <laughs> percent. <laughs> <coughs> make it bigger here itself. So this method is uh, how does it work? You first write the station numbers of the curve. Okay. Yeah. Then you write what is the method or sign. Okay. Normally, the word sign distribution in a curve is something like this. It is linearly varying in the transition, uniform in the circular portion, then linearly getting reduced. Isn't it? This is the word sign diagram for a curve. So it will be varying from 0 to a particular value which is on the curve, this is the birth size on a curve. So it is varying from 0 to this value, then remaining uniform, then again reducing. Suppose this is a curve in which there are 5 stations in the transition portion. This is the transition portion. There are 5 stations over time will be varying linearly in this stretch, in this stretch say 5 stations. So what do you, uh, you uh, propose is, you propose my work time varying linearly up to 5 stations, then remaining uniform in the circular portion, then again reducing to 0 on the other side. Okay. And you have to keep in mind 
If the sum of the existing percent should be equal to the sum of the proposed percent, that is the property between any two sets of tangents, that is the property. If you have a curve here and you, if you have another curve here, the sum of percent remains the same. The sum of the percent will remain the same. If you have two curves between the same sets of tangents, whatever how many curves you take. The sum of the percent will remain same. Only thing is happening in this bottom curve, the percent will be less, but the number of stations will be more. Here, the percent will be more, but the number of stations will be less. So, if you sum up all the percent, the sum will remain the same. Same concept we are using here. Suppose this is my existing curve, and we are proposing this one. So, whatever percent we are proposing this, uh, for this one, the sum of the percent in both the cases should be same. Okay. So, we are proposing this percent and the sum, we are keeping it same. Then we are finding the difference at each station, what is the difference of the two percents. Okay. Then we are finding the first summation of these percents here. First summation is the summation up to that point. Like here. It is telling up to here and it is 0. When 0 plus 8 is 8, 8 plus 2 is 10, 10, plus 10 minus 4 is 6. 6 plus 2 is 8, 8 minus 4 is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0. So you are doing the cumulative. That is the first summation. Means if you want up to this first station, this is first, this one. For second station, it is the sum of these two. Third station, it is the sum of these three. Okay. So we find the first summation of the percent difference. Then you find the second summation of this first summation and you write a station ahead. Means the summation up to this point, you are writing it in the next station. So, you are writing like this, 0, 0 plus 8, you are writing here at the next station. So, this is the second summation of the percent difference. And if you double the second summation of percent difference, it gives the slew. Okay. But only catch is that if you don't have this value 0 at the last station, there will be, will be slew equal to 2 times this value. But at the end station, you don't want so much slew because you want to connect it to the original straight because curve will be something like this. Suppose you are, you are having a straight here, then transition, then circular, then transition, then this is the straight. And your existing curve is something like this, maybe. <laughs> okay, or you can say it may be connecting here, not here, maybe connecting in the strain somewhere here. And suppose this is the last station, first station and the last station are those stations where percent is zero. It may not be the actual starting and end of the curve, it can be ahead also. So, at these points, you don't want the slew as so a first station and the last station because you want to connect it to this point. So, but if this value is not zero, you have to make it zero by applying correcting couple. Means correcting couple is nothing but the change in the proposed percent, so that the second summation for this change is same in value but opposite in sign to this one. So that if you sum up these two, you get these final second summation. If you double it, this is the true. So this gives you the slew at different points. And then you find the final percent. This is the proposed percent. This is the change in the percent through the correcting couple. If you add these two, you get this final percent. What it means is that if you are having these existing percents, and if you slew by this amount, you will get this percent. So in this way, you find the slew at each and every point, at every station. This will give you the slew at each and every station, which may be 10 meters apart. Then in between you can interpolate. As I said, if it is 5 years, 10 years, in between it will be linearly varying from 5 to 10. May not be exactly linearly varying, but you have to assume it because you don't have the other option if you don't have intermediate readings. Okay, so this is a uh, basically string line method. I have told it very quickly. You may not be able to do, but at least you know there is a method to calculate the slope. How do I know? Correct. Correcting couple, you have to do uh, this value will come automatically. 
you have to make it zero here. The second summation, this is all the second summation of the Versailles difference. Now you have to multiply. It means that this is not coming zero. It means that this distribution which you have assumed is not correct. You have to change it. So you have to reduce somewhere. You have to increase somewhere. You have to do in such a way that the second summation, this is starts reducing. It means the negative value should be coming here. You keep on adding the, the second summation. You keep on doing the second summation. This value will keep on increasing. Suppose you put minus one plus one, some value will come. Then again, put minus one plus one. This value will keep on increasing. You keep on doing the value will come equal to the same as this value. If you put minus here, plus here, minus will come here. If you put plus here, minus here, plus will come here. Okay. Because correcting couple, uh, the second summation is nothing but the moment of the Versailles diagram about the last station. If you are taking the moment, this will be minus, giving minus moment, this will be giving plus moment. And we are adding minus plus because the sum of Versailles should not change. We have assumed from Versailles, we are changing. So whatever, by whatever amount we are reducing, the same amount we have to increase somewhere. If you want minus, we have to keep Minus away from this point so that you get more moment and positive near to that so that you get less moment and the ultimately the net effect will be minus. That is the theory behind the string line methods. We are not discussing that part in detail, but at least this is uh, you know that this is the method of calculating the slews or realignment of the graph. Uh, and uh, in uh, in our recent in our institute website we have four programs which can calculate these. Uh, realignment, some software have been developed, four software have been developed. Each has its own advantage. Uh, some software have the advantage, suppose you don't want any slew at particular point, suppose you have a bridge at this location. Okay, you cannot slew at the bridge. Then it has an option that at that point you put, I don't want any slew. So it will automatically slew the remaining portion. Yes, the whole line. Yeah. So you don't want any slew at that point. Don't want to slew the track at that point. Okay. Zero is zero next. Next thing, limit is one and hundred second. That is a that is a very difficult class. Yeah. That normally you should avoid such such sharp class when it comes. But if you don't have the option, our software in our website there is an option. You put I don't want any slew at this point. I want slew zero. Then it will automatically uh, choose the remaining part and bring the slope to zero at that point. Okay. We will go for today. Uh, the time for tea and the snacks. Oh, this is very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and there are softwares available which yeah. will do it very quickly. You have to just feed the value. What is my station number? What is my existing number? There is anything it will do on its own. You have to just read as far as this station, what is the value of the This station, what is the value Which you already know. If you have mother, just put those values. The remaining thing it will do on its own. Compound gun. Compound gun also you have to propose accordingly the value Yeah. Accordingly you have to propose the value here. Yeah. It will do. Suppose you print this value uh, and there is an option in the software whether you want uniform curve, other way you want compound curve, single curve, two curve, three curve, so many options are there. Okay. If you see the software uh, which is there in our, uh, on our website, so many options are there. You can put restriction, you can put two curves, you can put average curve, and so many options. Practically, what I found in different kind of itself. Yeah, yes, yeah, reverse curve also option is there. That, uh, that is the option is also there. Okay. For the time being, we have closed. Okay. Okay. Reverse curve realignment, I will discuss in the when we are working with the machine. Because that is what we are supposed to do. Okay. Yeah, with the machine. Okay. For today, we will break for today.